On a November night in 1879 in Boston, Massachusetts, a lecture was given by Chief Standing Bear of the Ponca tribe. It was attended by a 49-year-old woman who sat mesmerized as the dignified Indian told of the injustice that had driven his people from their land. The next day, the woman sent a cable to her husband in Colorado. Thankful that you will be east on business next month. Situation of the Ponca Indians necessitates extended time here. And so began a path that was to thrust Helen Hunt Jackson into the public eye as one of the foremost Indian policy reformers of the 19th century. From that moment in the Brunswick Hotel, she was fired with the indignation that was to be the motivating factor in everything she did or said or thought or wrote for the rest of her life. I cannot think of anything else from night to morning. She was to write a year later in a letter to a friend. This from a woman who until that moment had refused to ally herself to any cause of her time, neither abolition nor suffrage nor slavery. I should be found with Indians engraved on my brain when I am dead. A fire has been kindled within me which will never go out. She had made the trip to Massachusetts that fall for the 70th birthday celebration of Oliver Wendell Holmes. 49 years earlier in this house in Amherst, Massachusetts, on October 14, 1830, she was born Helen Maria Fisk, the daughter of a professor of languages and religion at Amherst College. It was the same year and place that her lifelong friend Emily Dickinson was born, but there any similarity with the reclusive poet ends. Helen was born a radical. Susan Coolidge was to write years later in a preface to Ramona. Question, doubt, adventure, resistance to the powers that be were in her very blood. She was a mischievous child who laughed out loud in chapel and shocked her parents' friends by replying to all questions with her favorite expression, It's all nonsense. In contrast, her younger sister Anne never caused her parents any worry. Anne does not require the vigilance that Helen does, their mother confessed. Helen is so wild, jumping rope, dressing up in odd things, and jumping out from behind doors. Helen was undoubtedly referring to her own experiences as a child when she wrote in a series of essays entitled The Inhumanities of Parents. With some parents, although they are neither harsh nor hard in manner, nor yet unloving in nature, the habitual first impulse seems to be to refuse, Fathers and mothers are habitually guilty of inhuman conduct, inflicting unnecessary pain on their children by needless denials of their innocent wishes and impulses. In October 1852, Helen married Army Lieutenant and physicist Edward Bissell Hunt and moved with him to New York. Their first son, Murray, died in his first year of a tumor on the brain. Eleven years later, Edward was accidentally killed while experimenting with a prototype submarine at the Brooklyn Naval Yard. Helen then devoted her time to caring for their only surviving child, Warren Horsford Hunt, nicknamed Rennie. In April 1865, tragedy struck a third time with the death of her beloved Rennie. It was a blow from which she very nearly did not recover. What a useless routine for one left alone, to be fed, to sleep, and to rise up to eat and sleep again. It was then, as she tried through her grief and loneliness to piece her life together, that she began to write. Her first poems dealt with the death of her son and were published under the pseudonym Mara. Ink-stained women, as Nathaniel Hawthorne derisively referred to women writers, often resorted to pseudonyms in the 19th century, and Helen Hunt was no exception. She wrote prolifically, using different pseudonyms, Sax Holm, Rip Van Winkle, and the initials H.H. She even wrote a series of novels and signed them No Name. She wrote poems, essays, letters, novels, children's stories, and travel pieces, impressions of everything she saw and felt and heard. Always outspoken, H.H. expressed her opinions on any subject that interested her. No man knows where his neighbor's prison lies, why does not the law protect children before the point at which life is endangered? Even on opinions themselves, H.H. voiced an opinion. The man who is ready to give pledge that the opinion he will hold tomorrow will be precisely the opinion he holds today has either thought very little or to little purpose or has resolved to quit thinking altogether. She had enormous success as a writer. 
The story is told that when Ralph Waldo Emerson was asked if he considered H.H. the best woman poet in America, he answered, perhaps it might be well to omit the woman. As well as achieving critical success, H.H. was well paid for her writings. She declared that while she did not write for money, she printed for it. In the matter of earning money, she was definitely a feminist. But in the midst of all this flurry of constant activity, all the acclaim, the travel, the friendships, the work, Helen's heart still ached, and she began to tire. Blindfolded and alone I stand, with unknown thresholds on each hand. And the darkness deepens as I grope, afraid to fear, afraid to hope. In the fall of 1873, Dr. Kate, the Amherst homeopathic doctor, prescribed a trip, this time to Colorado. Her first sight of the Colorado Plains almost convinced her to turn back. I shall never forget my sudden sense of hopeless disappointment. It was a gray day in November. There stretched before me to the east a bleak, bare, unrelieved, desolate plain, and to the west a dark range of mountains, snow-topped, rocky-walled, stern, cruel, relentless. Between lay the town of Colorado Springs, small, straight, new, treeless. One might die of such a place alone, I said bitterly. Death by disease would be more natural. But the next day, the sun shone and the clear air shimmered. After I had once seen the plains aglow, nothing could make them anything but beautiful. H.H. moved into the Colorado Springs Hotel. Her fellow boarders were very pleasant, particularly a Pennsylvania Quaker by the name of William Sharpless Jackson. Together, they took long drives into the mountains. The silence, the sense of space in these Rocky Mountain solitudes cannot be expressed. Some mysterious secret of summer underlies and outshines the perpetual snows. As spring approached, they embarked on longer excursions to Fair Play, Central City, and Denver. H.H. earned her living reporting on her explorations of the state for Eastern magazines, and by summer, she had ordered her trunk sent out with the intention of staying. On October 22, 1875, Helen Hunt married William Jackson in a Quaker ceremony in New Hampshire. Oh, suns and skies and flowers of June, count all your boasts together, Love loveth best of all the year, October's bright blue weather. Helen Hunt's best remembered poem, one that has been memorized by generations of schoolchildren, was written to commemorate the wedding. The Jacksons returned to Colorado Springs and settled in a house on Kiowa Street. Helen set to work transforming the house. The kitchen, the only room with a view of the mountains, was transformed into the living room. Beautiful wooden mantles were carved by local craftsmen. And though the house was small, every available inch of space was used to display Helen's collection of objects and paintings acquired on her travels. Rooms have just as much expression as faces. The instant we cross the threshold of a room, we know certain things about the person who lives in it. The walls and the floor and the tables and chairs all speak out at once and betray some of their owner's secrets. She was also writing steadily, but many of these works were not as well received as her earlier writings. And her letters of that period show that she was beginning to feel isolated in Colorado, that she missed the stimulation of the literary circles of the East. It was then in the fall of 1879 that H.H. left for New England on the journey that was to alter the course of her life. She arrived in Boston to find the newspapers full of stories of the suffering of the Ponca tribe. A small, peaceful tribe, the Poncas had been forcibly moved from their reservation in Dakota to Indian Territory in present-day Oklahoma. There they were settled on a waterless, barren tract and refused any payment for the land which they had surrendered. They stayed until 158 members of the tribe had died. Then, in early 1879, Chief Standing Bear, accompanied by 30 followers, headed north, carrying the body of his son, who had asked to be buried on their old reservation. Utterly exhausted, they arrived at the Omaha reservation and were immediately arrested for leaving Indian territory without permission. In court, Standing Bear rose to speak in their defense. 
This hand is not the color of yours, but if I pierce it, I shall feel pain. The blood that will flow from mine will be the same color as yours. I am a man. The same God made us both. Within a week, Judge Dundee had ruled in the Ponca's favor, and they were free. But their plight was still serious. Out of jail too late to plant, they were in grave danger of starving. Thomas Tibbles, the editor of the Omaha Herald, rallied to the cause and organized a lecture tour of the East in order to raise funds to support the tribe and recover their lands. The Tibbles Bear Show, as the Herald called them, left Omaha on October 10, 1879, and arrived in Boston on October 29th. It was there that Helen Hunt Jackson met Standing Bear, and after hearing his story, took up the cause of Indian policy reform. She moved into a hotel room in New York and began intensive research at the Astor Library, sifting methodically through every document she could find that had any bearing on the government's dealings with the northern Indian tribes. At night, she wrote letters to local newspapers about what she was learning. Her letter on the condition of the White River Utes, who were... Starving, not simply suffering hunger, but dying for want of food. ...drew an immediate public rebuttal from Secretary of the Interior Carl Schurz, who became in time one of her most prominent adversaries. Is this man a blockhead? H.H. asked in a private letter to the editor of the New York Independent. A heated exchange of letters between H.H. and Schurz followed. But eventually, realizing that letters to the editor were not enough, she resolved to write a book. Simply and curtly, a record of our broken treaties, and I will call it a century of dishonor. I never so much as dreamed what we have been guilty of. A nation that steals and lies and breaks promises will no more be respected or unpunished than a man who steals, lies, and breaks promises. Calling the book a sketch of the United States government's dealings with some of the Indian tribes, H.H. stated in her opening note, To write in full of any one of these Indian communities, of its forced migrations, wars, and miseries, would fill a volume by itself. All this I have been forced to leave untouched, in strict adherence to my object, which has been simply to show our causes for national shame in the matter of our treatment of the Indians. A Century of Dishonor was an exhaustive study, drawing upon official reports from both the War Department and the Department of the Interior. It concluded that... The testimony of some of the highest military officers of the United States is on record to the effect that in our Indian wars, almost without exception, the first aggressions have been made by white men. Her description of the atrocities of the Sand Creek Massacre, in which the 3rd Colorado Volunteers, under the command of Colonel Shivington, staged an unprovoked attack on a friendly band of Cheyenne and Arapaho, embroiled her in another controversial exchange of letters, this time with the former editor of the Rocky Mountain News, William Byers. In answer to Byers' assertion that at Sand Creek, Colorado soldiers have again covered themselves with glory. H.H. recounted from eyewitness testimony the incident of an Indian woman who caught a runaway horse and handed it to a soldier who in return shot her in the breast and afterward boasted of the act. It was by such deeds as this that the Colorado soldiers acquitted themselves well and covered themselves with glory. It was an opinion that didn't find many supporters in her new home state. Finally, in the fall of 1880, a century of dishonor was finished. I have put an enormous amount of solid work in it, and all the heart and soul I possess have gone in. When Congress reconvened that January, H.H. was ready. At their own expense, she and Will traveled to Washington to hand deliver copies bound in blood red cloth of the newly published book. Emblazoned on the cover was the quote, Look upon your hands, they are stained with the blood of your relations. But the congressional response was not what she had hoped for. She and Will watched from the gallery as many congressmen pushed aside the book without so much as glancing at it. On the other hand, the critical reviews were on the whole good. And on another positive note, 
The report from the commission appointed by the president to study the Ponca situation was released that same month to the newspapers. It was favorable to the Indians. Discouraged by the public response to her book, H.H. began to think of new ways to bring an awareness of the plight of the Indians to the American public. Perhaps a novel would be more effective. If I can only do one hundredth part for the Indians, what Mrs. Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin has done for the Negroes, I will be thankful. But to write a novel, first she needed to find a setting, the characters, and a story to tell. In the fall of 1881, H.H. was commissioned by Century Magazine to write a series of articles on the California missions, and in December, she arrived in Los Angeles to begin work. She brought with her numerous letters of introduction, one of them to Don Antonio de Coronel, former inspector of the Southern Indian missions for the Mexican government and a lifelong friend of the Indians. Don Coronel became a valuable resource for H.H., helping her to map out her route and supplying her with details on the history of the old California ranches and missions. In late January, she left for Santa Barbara. On her way, she stopped for a few hours at Camulos, the old Spanish homestead of the Del Valle family, which Don Coronel had recommended as the only California rancho in existence where the old ways could still be studied. The place vividly imprinted itself on her imagination, and two years later, she would be able to recall it in detail and write about what she had seen. At the Franciscan College in Santa Barbara, she began her study of Father Junipero Serra, the founder of the California missions. Her itinerary took her to many of the missions built under his guidance more than 100 years before, many now in ruins. In her article, she described life as it was during the height of the prosperity of the missions. In all the missions were buildings on a large scale, providing for hundreds of occupants. The whole place was a hive of industry, tillers, herders, children in schools, women spinning, bands of musicians. Surrounding these buildings were the homes of the Indian families, built of adobe or reeds after the native fashion. At every mission were wall gardens with waving palms, sparkling fountains, groves of olive trees, broad vineyards, and orchards of all manners of fruits. Overall, the sunny, delicious, winterless California sky. While the missions fascinated her, it was the plight of their former residents, the Mission Indians, that completely captured her attention. Following the passage of the Secularization Decree of 1833, former mission lands had been sold and the Mission Indians dispersed. From a population of 15,000 in 1852, the number of Mission Indians had dropped below 4,000 by 1881. H.H. visited the Temecula Valley, former home of the San Luis Rey Mission Indians, who had been removed and were now settled three miles away in the Pachanga Canyon. A dreary, hot little valley, bare with low, rocky buttes and not a drop of water in it. There she saw Indians with faces stamped indelibly by generations of suffering, immovable distrust underlying the sorrow. And she visited Saboba at the foot of the San Jacinto Mountains. From the teacher, Mary Sheriff, she learned that the Saboba Indians were in danger of losing their land. Immediately, H.H. H. wrote the Secretary of the Interior, Henry Teller. He responded by appointing her an official agent of the Interior Department to visit the Mission Indians in California and ascertain the location and condition of various bands and what, if any, lands should be purchased for their use. She accepted and requested that her friend, Abbott Kinney, be appointed co-commissioner. In March 1883, they set off. Wherever they went, H.H. was given baskets, pottery, and samples of lace. It was Kinney's job to act as interpreter, while H.H. took pages of notes on the conditions of the tribes they visited. Writing to a friend of their findings, she said, I did not believe that such heart-sickening fraud, violence, and cruelty as we have unearthed here could exist in civilized communities. Returning to Saboba, she discovered that the Indians had been ordered to move. Enraged, she wrote, There is not in all the century of dishonor so black a chapter as the history of these mission Indians. 
venerable farmers for a hundred years, driven off their lands like foxes and wolves. Back home, she settled down to write her report, 56 pages on the condition of the Mission Indians of the three southernmost counties, concluding with a list of 11 specific recommendations, including the resurveying of present reservations, the removal of whites from reservations, the establishment of more schools, and the purchase of new lands. It was completed by July 1883, and she sent it to Washington. During the previous two years, as she collected material for her articles, H.H. had also been preparing the ground for another, more ambitious project, her Indian novel. The setting and the characters were in place. Now all that she needed was the story. Then, one October morning, before she was fully awake, the plot flashed into her mind. She left as soon as she could for New York. There, at the Berkeley Hotel on December 1, 1883, the first words of Ramona were written. I find that it is all so predestined in my mind that nothing remains but the writing down. As soon as I began, it seemed impossible to write fast enough. I'm writing 2,000 words in a morning, and I cannot help it. Am I possessed by a demon? She wrote to the coronels in California that she intended to... Set forth some Indian experiences in a way to move people's hearts, to influence public sentiment on the Indian question. Ramona was completed at 11 p.m. March 8, 1884, and was published soon after. It was an instant success. The tragic story of Ramona, the half-Indian adopted daughter of the aristocratic Moreno family, and Alessandro, the Indian she loves, captured the imagination of the American public for a hundred years. Through more than 300 printings, three movie versions, an annual pageant at Hemet, California, and until it closed its doors to tourists, thousands visited Camulos, the rancho that had inspired the Moreno homestead. With Ramona, H.H. had succeeded in what she had set out to do. To draw a picture so winning that the reader will become thoroughly interested in the characters and would have swallowed a big dose of information on the Indian question without knowing it. But she was not to know in her lifetime just how successful her work was. Ramona was in print just 10 months before H.H.'s death of cancer in San Francisco on August 12, 1885. She was 55. Four days before her death, she wrote to Grover Cleveland, President of the United States. Dear Sir, from my deathbed, I send you a message of heartfelt thanks for what you have already done for the Indians. I ask you to read my century of dishonor. I am dying happier for the belief I have that it is your hand that is destined to strike the first steady blow toward lifting this burden of infamy from our country and righting the wrongs of the Indian race. With respect and gratitude, Helen Jackson. When she received word of her friend's death, Emily Dickinson wrote to William Jackson, Helen of Troy will die, but Helen of Colorado never. Dear friend, can you walk, were the last words I wrote her. Dear friend, I can fly her immortal reply. And when remembering me, you come some day and stand there. Speak no praise, but only say, how she loved us, it was that which made her dear. Those are the words that I shall joy to hear. <laughs>